Composer John Oliver writes and performs music for acoustic instruments and electroacoustic media. His music has been described as wonderfully creative by fanfare and displays a delicate yet often complex sense of beauty by music works. Based in Vancouver, Oliver believes that music should resonate the whole listener, emotion, mind, and body. His music has been heard in performances in Europe, Asia, and the Americas, and appears on over 25 commercial and independent releases. And now my interview with John Oliver. I'm your host of the Redshift Radio podcast, Adrian Verdeo. Podcasting to you today from my home studio in Vancouver, B.C., on the traditional unceded territories of the Musqueam, Squamish, and tsleil peoples. So, John, thanks for joining me today. It's good to see you back in person, and we recently were catching up at some concerts and chatting about some of your recent projects, so thanks again for stopping by today. Yeah, my pleasure. So you were sending me some music and telling me some of, uh, telling me something about your recent explorations with these synthesizers and uh, working in electronic music mediums. Um, but I know, obviously, you have a strong background in guitar and uh, let's call it formal classical composition. Uh, so I, I thought maybe I could ask you a little bit about your past with the guitar and specifically classical guitar. Um, most of us kind of drifted into the classical realm, um, speaking for myself and others as, you know, having played electric guitar and other styles earlier in life. Was that the case with you or did you begin your studies in classical guitar? I started strumming an acoustic guitar at the age of eight, strumming Gordon Lightfoot chords. Rest and, in uh, peace. Yeah. <laughs> right, yeah. And uh, I think when a couple of years later, my parents bought me a 12 string so I could really sound like Gordon Lightfoot. And then I think at the age of 11, I discovered classical music and we moved to Vancouver and I heard a concert by Robert Jordan and he became my teacher until I graduated high school. So you are from Vancouver, you grew up in Vancouver, and um, you've been here most of your life, uh, but you studied at least at some point at the San Francisco Conservatory, is that right? Yeah, I went straight from high school to the San Francisco Conservatory. Um, I was actually um, accepted by a strange circumstance where we had missed the auditions in Vancouver, and my family took us on a vacation to California on spring break, and we walked into the conservatory, and... And uh, my parents said, oh, my son's interested in studying here. Can we see a syllabus? And uh, the secretary said, hang on a second, uh, guitar? I think we have our, uh, one of our instructors here. Let me just see if he's here. He was there. George Sackler came, came out, and uh, I played a little bit of Fernando Sor for him, not very much. And he said, oh, um, that's great. You're accepted. I'll, I'll make sure you get in, do the paperwork. So that was uh, the sort of kickstart to my career, uh, my to my studies at least. Uh, this was a hotbed of Baroque performance practice, uh, the height of that in the late 70s. And uh, John Adams was uh, teaching composition there. That was his only day job ever. Um, so it was a, just a fantastic experience for me. Did you have personal interactions and or tutorship with Adams himself, or were you um, actually just more aware of his music from hearing performances? When I arrived there, um, I had already been writing guitar music since I was about 12 years old, and uh, I was interested in writing, so there was a course called Composition Workshop. So I enrolled in that, and in the second semester, John Adams was the teacher. And we wrote music in the style of uh, Haydn, Mozart, Mahler, Chopin, Beethoven, whatever. Uh, at the end of the course, John Adams said, well, you know, there's a, a course for people who want to study composition. It's called Composition Seminar. Maybe you should take that next year. And so I did, and he really encouraged me. And then I had private lessons and uh, really got to know him. And uh, it was really a result of that uh, experience that I decided at the age of 20 that uh, a career in classical guitar performance really wasn't for me. I, I wanted to write music. Yeah. I guess it's just that obvious thing of where you're going to put your time. Are you going to practice for five or six hours a day to maintain a program or do you have sort of a 
budding creative voice that you wanted to do your own music and get it out there working with performers and that um was there a a period of time where you're really fascinated by repertoire and or was there a specific area of repertoire beyond soar that uh, appealed to you uh, in terms of classical guitar, um, I really liked the Julian Bream commissions, basically all of that repertoire. I really loved that stuff yeah. and uh, focused a lot of energy on uh, Walton and Berkeley and that repertoire. Uh, but then I, you know, uh, I have to backtrack a bit and say that in high school, I took a, I, I kind of did an independent studies course on music notation in grade 11. And uh, that's when I discovered the music of uh, Ligeti and Sinakis and the whole avant-garde. So already in high school, my interests were developing in a completely different direction than classical guitar. Uh, so it was a natural thing for me to pursue that at the conservatory. Uh, so I wasn't particularly interested or, or actually didn't find avant-garde music for the classical guitar that worked or that I actually liked playing. I liked Hens's um, pieces, what were they called? Tientos. The winter music or uh, Tientos, yeah. Yeah, um, and, and stuff like that. So I did dip into it, but I found that the writing wasn't particularly attractive on the guitar. So I kind of sidestepped it. I know you've been very active as an electric guitarist, uh, both as a performer and having written a lot of compositions with the electric guitar. Um, in your pop music playing days, did you have a rock phase? Uh, obviously, there's a lot of great music on the West Coast, and at that time, um, was there some inspiration you drew from either sort of avant-garde rock, jazz, or uh, other forms of popular music with the electric guitar? Uh, well, you know, I think everybody who can play the six strings tries to play electric guitar. So when I was in high school, I played rhythm guitar in, in a band and backup vocals, stuff like that. Uh, but we didn't do anything particularly unusual. It was all, you know, top 40 type of stuff, you know, Beatles, Doobie Brothers, this kind of thing. Um, so I was, I was interested when it came to electric guitar in the sound of Jimi Hendrix. Uh, but we weren't doing that in the band, so, uh, you know, I, I didn't pursue it very much. I actually came to electric guitar almost late, after I'd finished all my studies. I kind of backtracked, and I was interested in electronic music, so I wanted to see how I could integrate guitar into that, and electric guitar uh, was really the only sensible way to interact with electronics, because of the nature of the instrument. Um, and I was doing MIDI guitar very early on, controlling synthesizers um, and uh, an Atari computer in the 1980s. So my whole electric guitar thing was already, once I came back into it in my 20s and uh, actually early 30s, um, it was more experimental right away. You recently mentioned that some of your recent pieces, you're deliberately staying away from from playing guitar um, as a sort of a primary instrument and uh, really focusing on synthesizers and other means of music creation. Is there a particular reason for that other than just exploring new colors and sounds? Do you find, as a guitarist, it's difficult to um, kind of step away from certain patterns or habits you have uh, compositionally or strictly as, a, as an improvising player? Um, what are your thoughts on guitar currently in your compositional output? Yeah, that's that's a tough one. <laughs> um, the uh, uh, my my compositional interest uh, early on went into uh, larger textures and things that were clearly not uh, sort of notey, uh, not note-based, organized according to, you know, musical thinking and whatnot, but very much uh, developing um, sound colors, color transformations, and these kinds of things, which all are more based on vocal uh, type of, of music, a sustained line. So the plucked instrument 
wasn't of much interest to me, frankly. And so when I use a guitar these days, I tend to stay away from harmonic progressions. Um, I tend to use a combination of uh, resonant properties that reinforce certain um, structural patterns or evolution in a piece, but uh, I, I tend to stay away from my fingers doing things. Although, when they do, I try to get them to do things that, uh, as I say, don't really follow a, a kind of standard harmonic logic or, you know, these sort of preordained or already understood ways of writing. I'm really interested in creating new sounds. So, uh, the that means that when I do use the guitar, I tend to extend it with a lot of processing. I know also that you've worked extensively with musicians from other musical cultures, non-Western instruments, um, both in plucked strings, uh, families, and otherwise. Um, you played with various ensembles, including the Vancouver Intercultural Orchestra. I know you had a group, uh, was it the Big World uh, Ensemble some years ago, um, involving various instruments, again, from, from different cultures. Um, are there some elements from other plucked strings from various other uh, musical uh, backgrounds that you absorb into your guitar writing, uh, that you take some inspiration with and filter into the classical guitar? <laughs> Actually, no, I, I write for those instruments and I let, uh, let's just say my philosophy toward writing for any instrument is to uh, make sure that the instrument's voice is speaking. Um, I, I'm not a conceptual artist who imposes a concept on an instrumentation. That's of no interest really to me. Not to say that I don't have concepts and structural things and so on going on, but uh, when I'm writing for any group of instruments, I want to study each of the instruments in detail, how their sound production works, and what the most effective ways uh, are to write for the instrument to make it really speak in its own natural voice. That comes from being a classical guitarist because our instrument is best understood by classical guitarists. And composers who don't play the instrument have trouble making it speak. They, they have trouble getting the resonances to come out and to, to create music that feels natural for the fingers and that sounds well. It's one of the great conundrums of classical guitar uh, repertoire. So I take that uh, desire to make an instrument speak, my own instrument, and I take that into any instrument that I write for. So that's why I love writing for all these uh, lesser known plucked instruments and, and uh, instruments from other cultures, because it's the same sound world, but when a guzhong bends the string, it's just a totally different story, Yeah, you know. And there are some pieces in your catalog, such as The Dream of Africa, where there are alternate versions. Uh, uh, for example, I think that piece, there is a version for two guitars, and then another uh, with, is it pipa or uh, pipa and guitar? Uh, actually, the most successful and well-known is for violin. Violin. Violin or viola. Uh, originally, I wrote it for viola and guitar. Oh, okay. Or, or actually, originally, I wrote it as a duet for the Chinese ron, which is a four-stringed uh, yeah. plucked instrument. I see. Um, but then uh, I really liked the version taking her part. That was uh, Jimin Yu. Uh, we had a duo for several years. And uh, transcribing that for uh, viola was just a, uh, it sounded really great. Yeah. Obviously, encountering, you probably encounter some um, logistical issues working with musicians from other cultures as far as just engaging with the score. Um, perhaps at some point you allow more room for improvisation or uh, for the performer to put their stamp on the piece in a certain way, or are you much more prescriptive and um, expect a more of a literal approach from your scores to what degree do you allow input from performers in that circumstance yeah that's a really good question because uh i started out 
this journey in about 2004 when I was writing a piece for Mei Han uh, for Jung and String Quartet called Purple Lotus Bud. And I took a traditional tune for her instrument called uh, Pink Lotus in Many Modes. And I kind of mixed it with a blues type of feeling in the intro, and that's where I got the title Purple Lotus Bud. So combination of blue and pink, um, and that it's going to burst forth into some new experience with that ancient uh, Chinese tune. So in that piece, I was quite prescriptive. I wrote for a string quartet, so I had to be very precise in everything that I wanted to sound and was not going to rely on them to do anything, add anything except their own natural musicality. Uh, and for Jung, it was the same thing. I really literally wrote out the whole score. But there were very few things that were really hard to figure out for her. I did, however, write the whole part out in cipher notation, which is the notation that they're used to reading. Um, so, sh so she used that for her performance. Um, then we formed a duo and did a concert at Music in the Morning for classical guitar and Jung. And I wrote a short piece for her, um, and uh, I think it was called Still Turning. And uh, I got really precise. I wanted her to bend the the string according to a very specific uh, kind of complex rhythm. Hmm. It looked really difficult on the page. And then I I said, well, uh, just can I touch your jung? And I, I just played the passage. And she said, oh, well, that's easy. <laughs> and that's when I thought, well, yeah, why don't I just write the bar and then just align with a certain number of bumps on it that ends at a certain point. You know, there was a graphic notation rather than something that looks like a, you know, a Zanaka score or something. Right. So uh, the answer to your question is that when it comes to writing for musicians uh, who have a combination of oral tradition and written tradition, or an oral tradition entirely, um, the composer shouldn't even think about the concept of letting the musician express themselves. Because their approach is the opposite. I express myself, give me some, some material to do that with. Uh, so it's kind of flipped around in terms of expectations. Uh, Western musicians want to be told what to do, and other cultures want to just make music. Uh, so I, I tend to um, now uh, create scores that are less, first of all, less complicated to rehearse and, and perform, and second of all, that are uh, open to uh, elaboration, ornamentation, and, and movement in the line. And on the other side of the coin, uh, probably working with Western musicians, orchestral musicians who are very literal in their approach, traditionally, um, sometimes can be a little bit tricky to get them off the page or to try to uh, give them license to improvise or, uh, you know, evolve a little bit more of the sort of oral kind of, uh, you know, tradition and in, in sort of uh, adding something other than, you know, what they're trained to do is exactly what the composer intends. Um, have you had some some issues combining musicians from those two different traditions in an ensemble setting or otherwise? Well, let's put it this way. I don't write for classically trained musicians who have no experience or interest in new music. I just won't write for them. Even orchestral musicians are trained? I have, when I've written orchestral pieces, obviously I have to deal with that. But that's a massive amount of musicians and it, it comes, it's, it's then orchestration and it's sound Sections masses and, and yeah. so on. So there's very little uh, expression, so-called, uh, for them to do much with. The conductor's in charge of that, more or less. So I have to get them on board with certain things I might want to do. Yeah. Uh, but in terms of chamber music, um, I'm only interested in working with people of like mind. And if they don't have the background, I, I'm not interested. Yeah. So I don't run across that problem very often because um, I, I work with people who, for example, have, have done some amount of uh, improvisation or free improvisation as well as re reading music. Yeah. Uh, so it, it really is, um, uh, let's, let's just say it's, it's, it's a threshold over which some people have never, they've never crossed it. 
And if you haven't had the experience, you're not qualified to do new music, basically. Speaking of improvisation, um, in your practice as a composer, um, in the genesis of your compositions in the early stages of developing concepts for your pieces, is improvisation a large part of that process or um, is it sometimes uh, playing around with a synth and a patch perhaps in your computer or playing something on your guitar or noodling around um, or it, does it start from uh, more of an intellectual process? It depends. Yeah, it does. It depends uh, entirely on what the project is. Um, when I'm creating music for an ensemble, I tend to think conceptually first, and I tend to think very deeply about the combination of instruments and, uh, again, their resonant properties and so on. And, and if there's a theme in the commission, I have to think about that. Uh, so I tend to conceptualize in my head when I'm writing a commission for an ensemble. And the, the flip side to that is that when I'm doing personal projects, uh, for example, anything in electronic music, I tend to go much more for improvisation and interaction and, and the feedback circuit of the equipment that I'm using and, and the sounds that I'm developing. Yeah. So this, it's much more uh, experimental, I guess is the word. Uh, I suppose, like most of us, um, the personalities of the collaborators has some impact on the development of the piece and um, also in the way that you can conceive of uh, perhaps some of the themes of the piece. Um, imagine, you know, over the years you've developed a, a circle of close collaborators. Um, can you uh, give me some examples of some recent collaborations uh, in, in this way of... of um, playing or composing with uh, musicians and instruments uh, in which you're considering some of those elements? Yeah. Um, one of the most recent projects that I have actually where this is almost a bridged uh, situation is uh, a quartet that the Vancouver Intercultural Orchestra formed during the pandemic, uh, consisting of me playing classical guitar, uh, Joy Yue on harp, uh, Dai Lin Xie on Gujong and Ali Rasmi on Tar. So it's all plucked. It's an all plucked ensemble. Um, but each of these instruments has a completely different sound. Uh, together they sound like magic. It's incredible. Uh, so they also commissioned me to write two pieces for the ensemble. And uh, so this gave me an opportunity to really have classical guitar at the center of the sound. And that's pretty well the first time I've been able to do that other than writing guitar quartets and guitar chamber music. And so uh, I was actually able to pursue a piece that was at once a kind of concept of um, actually harmonic uh, evolution um, and its amplification through this ensemble. Uh, that's a piece called Gradual. And then the other piece called Arch, uh, I retuned one interval uh, quarter tone sharp, and uh, the harp had to retune that one note, and it's a note that the Persian player really likes, and it's a note that's easy to bend to on the Chinese instrument. So I created this other piece called Arch that has uh, melodic arch structures in it, and uh, again, the guitar is, is an accompaniment instrument in both of these pieces, so it's kind of funny. I'm not showing off uh, in these pieces. I'm letting the other musicians uh, take that space. So that's a recent project where I'm, you know, really writing for f four sp very specific individuals, uh, of which I'm one. So uh, it's, it's ver been very rewarding in that respect. Microtonal techniques have been um, sort of a, a feature of some of your works over the years, John. And uh, I happen to know this. I remember playing a piece uh, for harp and guitar some years ago of yours. Yes. And uh, you had mentioned your time studying with Bruce Mather uh, had some impact on this discovery and incorporation of microtonality in your work. Can you please discuss that collaboration or that encounter with Bruce? Yeah. Um, in fact, the piece that you played was called Amaja Bruce Mather. Um, now, Bruce uh, comes from a 12-tone type of background. Um, 
uh, but then he got interested in the music of Vishnagradsky, which is based on the notion that an octave does not need to resonate at exactly a one, a two to one or whatever ratio. Um, so Vishnagradsky developed a whole concept of the extended or compressed octave. And this was a way to create a kind of simultaneously dissonant and consonant music. Uh, so it's, it's a very special music that Vishnagradsky created and Bruce studied uh, with Vishnagradsky, I would say, and played a lot of his music. And I took a course on Vishnagradsky. And this is where I learned all about how you could create entire musical structures out of uh, divisions all the way up to 96 uh, notes per octave. Um, but his approach is all equal divisions. And I was early, early interested in the spectralist movement and in resonance and in the harmonic series. Um, so I wasn't particularly interested in this capacity to move among any key you want and to have that modular system that is chromaticism. I was more interested in kind of deep resonance. Um, and that goes all the way back to my days in San Francisco where I heard... Um, you know, Pauline Oliveris and her circle uh, uh, of people um, doing like these deep resonant things. So um, when I created that piece as an homage to Bruce, uh, it wasn't something that was trying to compliment him by using his techniques in any way. I was actually interested in creating a kind of a very consonant music that had a certain a certain type of energy that leans towards the Mather style, but um, develops my own more restricted microtonal universe, where those microtonal m movements are more natural, let's say, and more um, uh, grounded in, in traditional harmonic concepts. Have you written for specifically uh, microtonal guitars, just intonated guitars, um, those instruments with a special fretboard design, for example, um, or do you mostly move strings, string pegs, and use uh, as accurate tuning as you can using strobe tuners and so forth? Yeah, um, I don't really, uh, I haven't explored that very much. Um, it's um, it's an area that I, that I could go into. Uh, the piece that we just referred to, well, your guitar was tuned down a quarter tone, and you had to do hocket technique with the harp to make the the passages work. Um, so the the inflections that you hear in Persian music or Indian music and so on, those sound really great on those instruments. And um, I've looked into microtonal guitars, and I've also listened to a lot of um, recordings that play, you know, uh, Baroque music or earlier in different temperaments and so on and so forth. Um, I find it a bit recherche. <laughs> it's, um, I don't need to spend um, a lot of my life um, in that kind of detailed uh, thing, because uh, music is is much more than these theoretical differences of sense. Uh, that said, it is true when when things line up harmonically, they sound bigger. There's no question. So there's a there's a good reason to look into it. Uh, but when it comes to playing the guitar, you're putting your fingers on frets, and there's microtonal movement when you put your finger down anyway. So it's hard to think of it as a, a, t a technical, theoretical thing. You can set it up so that it would work, but you're always going to be putting a finger on a string. Yeah, I mean, you push that string a little too hard, it's going to go sharp. You bend the string a little bit too much. Again, you know, uh, there's inconsistencies that were kind of just conditioned to accept, I think, with the guitar, and then we may not notice them after even many years. Yeah, I mean, there's a, there's a margin of error in intervals anyway, yeah. and, and people don't really hear phase alignments unless there are two notes only, and they're sounding through a very consistent medium, like two oscillators, for example. Right. Um, but otherwise, uh, there's always some phase cancellation of some kind going on yeah. uh, in, in any sounding environment. Yeah, for sure. Have you used uh, or written for extended range instruments, guitars specifically, um, 7, 8, 10, 
12 string guitars or anything like that? Uh, no, I don't own one of those instruments and nobody's asked me to write for them. Okay. So might be an idea for the future then. <laughs> yeah, I, I, I'd totally be into it. Yeah. Well, you know, I was going to ask you about, um, obviously you've written a wealth of guitar music and I encourage, um, uh, players and students and professionals to check out your catalog because I think you have a range of levels and styles for the instrument ranging mm. from very advanced, very difficult pieces to much more approachable, uh, almost I would say like etudes um, in some regard for younger students and developing students. Um, and of course that comes from your years as a music educator um, and somebody who's worked with a lot of guitarists in professional settings as well. Obviously, in the guitar world, we're always a little bit on the outside of the orchestral family, uh, you know, the sort of mainstream of classical musical literature. Um, how do you kind of negotiate that, grapple with that, and um, sort of account for the tastes of the classical guitar world? I mean, you've done pretty well, I would say. Uh, it seems to develop commissions from players all over, uh, you know, the world in North America. Uh, and yet I found that there is a sort of a conservative streak within the classical hotel guitar repertoire and perhaps some ideas that are, you know, a little bit passe still. Um, sometimes you talk about contemporary music and they're really referring to music that's 40, 50 years old. Yeah, um, exactly. What are your thoughts on that, John? And how do you see the modern trajectory of contemporary music in the guitar literature? Yeah, that, that's a tough one. Um, so... You know, uh, when Julian Bream did those commissions, he uh, uh, very um, uh, purposely uh, approached composers who did not know the guitar. And he developed a very intimate relationship with them to develop guitar music that would sound good. And specifically that Julian Bream would like to play. Uh, you can hear it in the pieces. Uh, but that music, no matter how much you love it, if you're writing in a style that sounds like that, you're writing old music, not new music. Very old music, really. Yeah. I mean, the 60s, now, 1960s. Yeah, now very old music. Uh, so, you know, early on I wanted to get away from that as much as possible. So when I did write for the guitar, um, I would try out new sounds and new techniques and... Uh, uh, one of my early guitar duos, uh, I tuned the low E string down a fifth so that it was in an octave relationship to the fifth string. And then I created a spectral canon. Uh, that piece is called Guacamayo's 11,000th Polemic Number 1, which is kind of a Monty Python reference, and I was writing an opera at the time based on the Mayan Popol Vuh, and the main character is called... Guacamayo, which just means bird or parrot. Um, and so it was kind of a character sketch. Uh, so it goes through various different sections where I'm revealing uh, new things you can do on the guitar. So it's kind of a compendium of new techniques or new combinations of sounds. And that's because I wanted to get way far away from the traditional guitar sound. That kind of writing has become much more current, uh, I would say, among a generation younger than myself. Uh, maybe I was leading the way, I'm not sure, but I, I would say that the composers that I was interested in, if they would had written for guitar, would have written music similar to what I was doing. So I, I do think it comes out of the whole uh, tradition of critiquing serial music and uh, proposing that music that is uh, uh, based on either deep resonance or textural transformation would be a more interesting path that people would actually want to listen to. Yeah, and that's that's certainly where where I the direction I was headed at the time, and and that was in my uh, mid twenties. And you continue to work as an educator uh, with young guitar students of all ages, I suppose, uh, in different styles. Of course, you you have the insight to teach in a variety of uh, capacities. Do you work with young composers as well, John? Um, do you have a background in compositional instruction? Um, I've done a bit of that, but um, uh, how, can I, how can I put this? Um, you know, it's, it's really hard to teach composition, as it were. Um, I'm a believer in having uh, all of the fundamentals in place. So... 
um, creativity is something that that people have uh, to various degrees, and that's not something that you can really teach. You can open doors, you can introduce a young mind to various things, but I've had the opportunity to teach young people, and what I find more often than not is that they need um, music theory, and they need more uh, involvement on a musical instrument, and that they're not really ready to ha be introduced to any advanced kind of compositional things that uh, that I would be very passionate to teach. Um, so I would end up teaching. Uh, more or less rudiments, like how to create a proper classical phrase over traditional chord progressions. And so those are the building blocks to understand how music has worked, uh, you know, in the classical era, uh, common practice period. Because I think that's very informative for understanding how you can create a moving musical structure. And it's better to get your handle on that, which is closer to the music that we're hearing around us all the time, than to kind of try to skip over that and, and be introduced to concepts that are more avant-garde or, or, you know, more interesting for me. But I, I just, uh, I haven't been in that position to teach advanced uh, composition. Yeah. And uh, I had mentioned... Uh that I think you had written some pieces uh, which were kind of conceptually etudes for developing guitars. Is that right, John? Do you have some repertoire that's designed for student guitar um, players? Yeah. Uh, when I was, I think, I think it was after I got back from the conservatory, I just started writing these uh, studies. And uh, I wrote a number of them, probably five or six. And then a few people uh, started to play them, Daniel Bolshoi, Alan Reinhardt. And uh, so then I started to write some more, and I ended up with a collection of 15 of these. And um, they are in intended for people who are essentially studying Villalobos etudes and preludes, that era, uh, that uh, level of student. Um, so, yeah, I... Um, I've had some students play them, but they they haven't seen a lot of they haven't circulating that much because they're not published by a big publishing company, so they are available. So, John, tell us about this instrument you have, and uh, further, how have you been using this in your recent electronic music? Yeah, um, the last year has been a real voyage of discovery for me, and it has kind of. Started um, with a similar instrument to this one and ending now uh, in kind of in the same place. So um, I'll have to backtrack a little bit and talk about what happened during the pandemic. Um, I realized that I wouldn't be writing music for um, ensembles anymore because they were not giving concerts. So I thought, well, I'm going to go back into the studio and really spend some time with my electronic music instruments. But I was doing that all on computer at that time. So I invited some colleagues to send me tracks uh, by transferring the files to me, and that I would then process those tracks and create a new thing out of that. So those duos started with Stefan Osterjo, the Swedish guitarist, and we put out an album based on his improvisations in a uh, forest in Vietnam, where he was playing a Vietnamese lute and he had tied the strings to a tree. And so he was kind of playing the instrument, but letting the instrument resonate in the wind and so on. It's a very soundscapey type of recording, really interesting with a mixture of village sounds. So I took that and I basically resampled a lot. I broke it up into separate parts and then I resampled it and created these quite different pieces based on the original recordings. So the, that recording was a alternation of his uh, solos broken into sections and then my transformations of those sections. Really successful artistically, really a lot of fun to do. Uh, and then I thought, oh, well, I, I'd like to do another one of those. So then Douglas Schmidt uh, was in touch. He came back to Canada from many years away. And he's a bandoneon player and a composer well, quite well known in Canada. And uh, so we did the same thing. He sent me some files of some bandoneon solos he had done. And I did the same process again with him. And that was the second album I put out called Isolation Journal 2, Breathe. His concept was uh, that the music was all based on the rhythm uh, or duration of breath. 
which makes sense with the bandoneon. And um, then the third one I did with Francois Houle, I just, uh, he's a clarinetist in Vancouver and composer, and I said, Francois, just play me short things of, you know, that typical stuff you do. And so he did a kind of compendium of these very short uh, 20 second to maybe up to 45 second bursts of Francois Houle energy, which I took and did the same thing. That was the third album. The fourth album was, I invited six colleagues, and then we did the same thing, and that was a big project called Friends, uh, Isolation Journal for Friends. All of this processing was done on the computer with plugins, GRM plugins, all the classic uh, acousmatic uh, transformational tools. And then the pandemic was coming to an end, and I thought, well, I'm going to want to do this live now because this was a lot of fun. We did it all during the pandemic, but what if we could do this as a live as live concerts and, and so on. And then I thought, I don't want to do this with a computer. The work I had done was very detailed studio-based work. And it wasn't something you could really do live convincingly. So that's when I started to look at getting instruments that were live synthesizers or processors that you could perform in real time that would reproduce some of the aspects and flavor of the uh, kinds of techniques that I had used on the computer. So I immediately focused on granular synthesis because that's one of my favorite techniques. Um, so, and one of the first synthesizers I bought was the Moog synthesizer because I had studied that at McGill. I loved the sound and I wanted to get back into that sound world. The second one I bought was called Lyra by Soma Labs, uh, a Russian synthesizer maker uh, company. Um, and that thing is based on totally... Um, chaotic uh, frequency modulation synthesis. So it's based on, it's structured in such a way that you can't save presets, you can't tune the oscillators to a scale, and everything is constantly in motion and not reproducible. It's all based on a, a philosophy that life evolves and that you don't want to repeat things. It should always be a different experience. And so that synthesizer really took me into a completely different way of thinking about making electronic music. Um, and that took me away from things that are more um, preset based and like based on, on set laying down tracks and uh, creating very nice repeatable structures. Uh, so then I thought, well, what if I put my own system together by g gathering up these um, sound modules, uh, Eurorack sound modules. And so I started to build a modular system where you had to patch everything in. And then I realized, oh, well, patching everything in, even though I can't save it and it's still all in real time, patching is a bit of a slow uh, operation. And unless you're in for, uh, you know, a five-hour rave where everybody's, like, I don't know, stoned or, and they're going to follow it at a very slow pace and there's a constant beat to sort of keep the interest going, that whole techno rave thing, I thought, no, that's I'm not going there either. So that's when I got back into... Uh, the Soma Lyra, and then recently I bought this uh, green instrument here uh, called Enner. And with both of the, these instruments, you make the connections by touching with your body. So the electricity in your body makes the connections and makes the music happen. And if you take your hands off, it stops. In the case of Lyra, it has a hold switch or uh, uh, knob. So you can actually turn the oscillators on so that they drone and then you can manipulate the drone. So there is a way to keep that one going. This one here, enter, um, if you take your hands off it, the sound stops. And so it's very interactive and very immediate and it's structured in such a way that there are various um, possibilities, oscillators and um, filters and stuff. Very interesting instrument. So I'm, I'm now back to a point where I want to be able to play electronic music as though it was a, an instrument with strings on it. Just I put my hands on it and it's immediate and my hands are off and it's, it's gone. And I figure that's the way to really um, interact with other musicians in a, a more real-time way. That said, I also really am still uh, working with setups in the modular system that will do granular mod, uh, processing of any of the sounds. So I'm still really attracted to that very textural uh, and, and potentially evolving 
uh, structure that that I can set up in a modular system. So I'm kind of bringing these two wor worlds together right now, and it's it's obviously my pet project for the moment. Was this instrument used in Squid and Chains? And also, can you tell us about that project, John? Um, yeah. So. Um, Squid and Chains was essentially the uh, first step toward um, doing this kind of music live. And uh, Enter has not entered that world quite yet, because it's quite new. But the Lyra synthesizer is at the core of a lot of those tracks. Um, and uh, every time... Uh, so, so what is Squid and Chains? Squid and Chains is a, a, a duo trio. Um, essentially, Douglas Schmidt and I got together and started jamming, and the results were quite astonishing. We were very pleased with the results. Uh, and then Francois Ull was early on, uh, when he was in town, he came over and we also jammed. And so we created a, a lot of really wonderful stuff, uh, and in, in uh, March of last year, uh, actually on the night of the Russian invasion of Ukraine, we had been jamming that night and learned of the news the next day. And uh, so we released this EP called um, Sirens of Kiev, and uh, that's our first release from that time. And uh, these are very textural, evocative, lyrical sorts of tracks that sound somewhat strident at times and then somewhat kind of beautifully lyrical at times as well. Because you have melodic instruments mixed in with these electronics, textures and, and so on. So uh, that's how we, we got started. And uh, the instrument that seems to be there almost all the time is this very haunting instrument I've been referring to called Lyra 8. Um, Enter is more direct, and that's going to transform our sound uh, somewhat um, in, in a good way, I think. Uh, and, and always the constant will be that, that kind of haunting sound in it, and then the breaking up of the sound by using what's called granular synthesis, which basically breaks up the sound that goes in into small particles that we then I then manipulate. Do you find that there's, I mean, obviously there's a learning curve with any instrument, um, and for both of us, you know, having grown up with, uh, you know, guitars and, and amps and pianos and, and, you know, as you mentioned, very tactile, hands-on experiences, but also you, you were in uh, really kind of in the early days of um, a lot of... Um, at least commercially available electronic instruments uh, during the 70s and 80s and, of course, the 90s as well, and have grown through the evolution um, and the interfaces, the various ways of interfacing with those instruments. Um, and for speaking for myself, I always find that there is a, you know, a, a period of at least several months before I can feel like this thing is an extension of my musicality, mm -hmm. of my sort of uh, physical uh, interaction with the instrument. Um, I take it that the, the Enner and the Lyra are a little bit it is designed in a way that it's more intuitive to, you know, folks like us who have a musical background. But um, did you find yourself um, kind of like in that spiral with the computer and, and with the patch bay, with the, um, with the modular, uh, where there is that kind of separation um, in a real time situation? And uh, do these instruments offer more immediacy? Yeah, uh, that is precisely um, the, the issue. Um, it's that distancing that, as a musician who's, you know, grown up playing musical instruments and singing and so on, everything very immediate, um, it's uh, it, it it takes a, a kind of strange background where you're willing or you've already done a lot of uh, legwork on programming synthesizers. Um, because I, I was at McGill um, patching a Moog synthesizer one year and then programming a DX7 the next year, I really... Uh, burnt a lot of brain cells on the notion of creating sound worlds that I could then use. Um, in the case of Moog, you could actually record straight to tape, uh, but but then it was you know a process that was encumbered by um, a limitation of the knowledge of how many possibilities I could actually develop in that system. Um, with the DX7, it was easier because you could design the sound, save it, and then maybe make a copy and make a variation so you could create families of sounds and but it was always a, a, a not in real time you would save a preset and then you would uh, after you had created your sound world almost in the abstract then you could maybe 
play around with it, but it was always a two-step process rather than something immediate. And uh, that's sort of also the case with modular, although you could just set the thing going and uh, if you have the right configuration of modules, you can set it up so that you can just kind of launch a process and move forward with it and see where it goes. Um, so modular is kind of a, a better approach in terms of process because if you are a composer who does think in terms of uh, evolution and processes, then you can set up a modular system so that you patch it up in a certain way where you begin a process and you know what you've set up so you know how you might be able to transform it over time. That is a very process-based uh, approach, however, and it tends to create a certain type of music. These tactile synthesizers are much more immediate and because you are controlling every moment of it, you are actually in the moment improvising as a traditional improviser. And so if, you, if it, a sound is emerging, you can, just by moving your finger, transform it in a certain way. So you have to become very familiar with the instrument in the same way that I became familiar with a guitar or any other instrument. Yeah. And that's what makes these tactile instruments really very special, is that they, they are designed uh, to get you to focus on the immediacy of the sound and to uh, bring your own background and your own experience to it so that you may understand the underlying principles that make the sounds. Yeah. So if you've studied FM, for example, and you know how filtering works and you know, you know uh, about uh, various elements of electronic music, then you put your hands on it. You go, oh, I know what's going on here. And you, you can actually explore with knowledge of the result rather than being ignorant and just you know, making some sounds, wow, that sounds interesting, but you don't know w how. Uh, somehow that knowledge of, of how the thing is structured, how the sound is produced, really gets you much closer to uh, being able to do a, a good thing with these instruments. You know, we're speaking in the break about um, approaching improvisation and intuitive music making uh, with the baggage of a lifetime of musical study and musical composition and uh, in, a, in a sense, setting up the parameters so that you can go in, trust your instincts, and just make music in an immediate way. Um, mm. Do you feel uh, you've sort of reached that point? And also, can you tell me how these recent recordings that you sent me uh, came to be? And also, what, what is the intention uh, uh, of those releases? Yeah, um, well, I've been releasing a lot of music uh, since, since the pandemic started, really. And... Um, it, it comes from uh, first of all when I'm in when I'm interacting when I'm making this music when I'm improvising this music I'm only listening to the sound and developing it in real time I don't have any preconceived notion uh, no imagery nothing like that uh, comes to me I love the sound of the instrument and I make sound, hit record, and that's about it. Then I filter and, and decide what might co go out on a release. Um, the sounds I find uh, are, they engage me because they have a vocal quality, they have a, a, a kind of haunting orchestral vocal quality. Um, I, I love writing orchestral music because of the sound of the orchestra. Uh, the work of writing for so many instruments and all of the knowledge that you need for that requires lots of study. Yeah. Um, and so this is a very immediate way to create the same feeling in electronic music um, and, and, and to evoke a, a kind of textural world that, that, I mean, it evokes something every single time and I can't put it in words. <laughs> That's the beauty of it, really. Um, so, uh, I don't know if that answers your question. Um, where was that going? Yeah, uh, um, it, it does. And I was, um, going to pivot to ask about some of the recent recordings as well. Um, but while we're on the topic, uh, in, you know, with your experience and, and as, in, as you mentioned, sort of being on the forefront of a lot of both music technology and, you know, being aware of the avant-garde, being aware of all these world music styles. Um, I'm just curious also, um, what your uh, view is about the 
evolution of music, uh, in the way that the music is being disseminated and produced. Um, obviously, in the time when you started, uh, a young composer would have to reach out to orchestras, would have to do things the old-fashioned way, you know, uh, get the commissions, go, th- you know, to the festivals, whatever it is, right? Um, mm. And uh, nowadays, obviously, with a laptop and, you know, a, a dose of creativity, people can generate music completely independently, put it out there, have develop an audience. And you've been doing that. And obviously, you know, this is something that's kind of of, of the newer generation. Um, do you foresee that that is the way that our industry is going in the way that people will now be uh, more free to create music in an immediate way um, and or do you see that audiences have a different expectation about in the way that the music is being delivered to them yeah good good question um lots of components there um uh, so music is is around us uh constantly uh but usually at, at very low grade qualities um and that is something that uh uh, helps the commercial music industry um, very much because it's very easy for them to produce music that sounds good on all platforms and is essentially entertainment in, ter- in terms of art music and uh, its development um, I it, it's hard for me to um, articulate it because um, there's a, an existing um, kind of network of of players and composers and so on who and uh, who and concert presenters who are presenting works to the public and not much has changed in terms of how this is done it's a live concert the music is uh presented to an audience of usually around 100 people and there's not much different difference there except there's a a, a tendency to uh, f- uh there's a more of an openness to um non-academic people for example um uh, songwriters uh, doing experimental music and so on and and that kind of hybrid that's emerged over the past probably 20 years um you know that that i think is a result of the kind of post-minimalist trend in new york city for example um that has brought forth a whole uh enrichment of a whole bunch of music that is made by people who don't particularly associate themselves with like new music ensembles yeah um you get uh techniques that used to be the purview of avant-garde uh, composers and, and performers now filtering their way into new folk, for example, yeah. you know, and, uh, uh, so, so the, the, the availability of the technology and, and the ability to record anything and put it in your computer and, and integrate it into your production has, has changed the way a lot of underground, underground music happens There's more underground music now than probably ever before. And a lot of it's really interesting. And f- for me, I just, uh, I find that things are still def- defined um, according to a kind of local culture. And um, that there are there are things that are happening in the world that come out of various different cultures that in my view, musically are just uh, as interesting, uh, if not more than the stuff that might be confined to the previous, um, cohorts, right? Uh, one example is Japanese noise, which nobody particularly listens to around here. But if you listen to some of that stuff, you just say, wow, I mean, how are they doing that? That's incredible. Um, but you wouldn't see, uh, your traditional audience that are my friends and colleagues going to that concert necessarily. Right. (laughs) So, um, I, I find it's an interesting time where, um, the knowledge that, used to be the purview of, of university graduates is, is now incorporated into sample libraries and all sorts of things that are available to just anybody. And that has, has transformed the way music is made for sure. Yeah. Well, lastly, John, I want to thank you so much for stopping by today. Uh, it's great to catch up. It's great to kind of, uh, you know, pull the thread and, and kind of see what makes you tick a little bit. Um, uh, and lastly, uh, I would uh, just ask if there's anything that you want to mention is coming up or any uh, projects that you're excited to announce. Um, yeah. Um, 
Well, there's a couple of things. Um, something that I, uh, some recordings that I sent to you as a preview, um, is the idea that I would do something with guitar, and that I would actually release that to the public. <laughs> and uh, so that's a project that is now finally coming to the front burner. It's been on the back burner for quite some time. And um, that's going to be an interesting release that'll come up fairly soon. And the other project is the Squid and Chains project. Uh, we have uh, a new album in the can, and we're going to be re releasing that in September. And the working title is Celestial Wanderer. Ooh, evocative. Yeah. Um, and it's sort of around the concept of the many moons that are out there in the universe. Um, and and um, I guess I could also say there's another um, kind of um, spontaneous improvisation that I did a few nights ago um, that uh, I will probably release uh, actually on a shorter term thing as a kind of one-off project that I'm going, just going to share with everybody on Bandcamp. And uh, um, I essentially went back to um, the modular system, which I had neglected. It had been sitting there and I had neglected it. So I said, well, what about that? I haven't ever really worked with that one. So let's, let's see what happens. I hit record in an hour later. I just went, okay, that's <laughs> yeah. really interesting. Cool. A stream of consci consciousness. It was very yeah. much a, just a go and uh, see what happens. Oh, fantastic. And, and the results are quite uh, stunning. Not something that I would have expected actually. So, Wonderful. Yeah. Well, do look forward to hearing it. Thank you so much for sharing your time today. And My I'll pleasure. provide links to uh, the website so people can check out your, your recent compositions and your extensive back catalog. So again, thanks so much, John. It's great to catch up. Thank you very much, Adrian. Take care.